Good morning and welcome to today's program. Uh, my name is Lauren Hurst and I'll be your host for today's discussion on empowering youth in water security. Now, this is the latest in our series of live interactive programs focused on water security and resource management. And today we're going to explore how to develop a career path in water related sectors. Uh, our expert panel today represents different professions in the water resources management space from civil society, the government, and also the private sector. And we're going to hear about their experiences and explore several example career paths in each area. Now, this program is going to proceed in three parts. And over the next hour and a half, we're going to discuss, number one, the importance of water diplomacy and international cooperation skills. Uh, number two, we're also going to discuss some strategies that young professionals can use to develop their careers in the water profession. And finally, we're going to take a look at the future and the professional landscape in the water, in the water resources sector and some of the expectations that we might have for the future. But first, before we get into all that, uh, let's meet our panelists briefly. Uh, Megan Livak is Association Engagement Manager for Students and Young Professionals with the Water Environment Federation. And she, jo she joins us from Alexandria, Virginia today. Hi, Megan, how are you? Hi, Lauren, I'm great. Thanks uh, for having me today. Great, thank you. Uh, Rocky Cassatt is Senior International Affairs Specialist at the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And she joins us from Washington, DC today. Rocky, welcome. Hi, Lauren, thanks for having me. And finally, we have Vijay Sundaram, and he is National Water Reuse Technical Practice Leader with Water Business Line at ACOM, and he joins us from Sacramento, California today. Hi, Vijay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Great, thanks for being with us. Uh, now, to get us started today, I'd like to welcome John Thompson. Uh, John is Deputy Assistant Secretary for Environment here at the U.S. Department of State. John, welcome. Thanks very much, Lauren, and hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I, as Lauren said, I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Environment in the Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs at the State Department. And each day I get to work on issues that range from combating wildlife trafficking, improving waste management and climate change, uh, all the way to solving transboundary water issues. Um, I think we have a really great program today that explores how youth and young professionals can engage on water issues, whether that's through public sector, private sector, or in civil society. And I just say, it's really essential that bright young professionals pursue careers in water and related fields like conservation, energy, uh, and agriculture, <clears throat> as these sectors really underpin our economy, health, and our security. Um, the situation uh, that we have is that around the world, over 2 billion people lack access to safe drinking water. And unfortunately, there's worse news than that. In the next 20 years, more than 40% of the global population will not have access to the water they need. Like many of our partners around the world, we're facing growing threats to water security here at home. Climate change threatens our water supplies and our water quality. Floods, droughts, and sea level rise are growing in frequency as well as in severity. But we're working to uh, very hard to help uh, address these issues and to help solve these problems. And to do so, we must ensure communities everywhere can adapt and build resilience to dangerous climate impacts. Uh, solving these big challenges requires many different sectors to work together, in particular with interdisciplinary approaches. It requires scientists and engineers, community organizers and educators, regulators and lawyers, utility ma managers and consultants. And I think very, very importantly for what we're talking about today, it requires young people like yourselves to dedicate your time and create new and innovative solutions. Um, we also rely on seasoned professionals who can help share their experiences 
and mentor new people in the water sector. Um, the State Department is leading US government efforts to strengthen global water security, and we need people like you to help us. To learn more about our environmental work, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can simply search Sci Diplomacy USA, and our accounts should pop up in your search. So please ask questions, tell us your stories, and enjoy today's program and the many insights that our speakers will share with you. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the program today, and, and back over to you, Lauren. Great, thank you, John, for those comments. Um, I think you really underscore the, the importance of addressing this issue, and uh, that's exactly what we want to uh, help communicate today is how young people really can get engaged in this sector and uh, really push forward the solutions that we need. So uh, let's go ahead and get into the first part, part of our program. Um, and let me give you a, just a little bit of background. When, when we conceived this program, we wanted to illustrate the many different paths and professional disciplines within the water sector. Uh, now this is an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, and it's very important that we pursue that because it, it also applies to many other areas. Uh, such as climate change, uh, which is uh, very pressing and is going to be a subject that will come up repeatedly in our discussion today. Uh, and so that is why we are presenting three different viewpoints uh, from the civil society angle, from the government and from the private sector. Uh, now to explore that further, uh, let's turn to our panelists and to get an idea of what they do and how they got to where they are today. Uh, so, Megan, let's start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about your work um, and some of the highlights of your career path, and how did you get started? Sure. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, so, I like to say that I just kind of fell into water. Um, I'm an example of a non-traditional addition to the sector. So, I graduated with a psychology degree um, and wound up working for a consulting civil engineering firm in New Jersey in their water wastewater group. Uh, but my real start is through volunteerism um, and a passionate community, which I found through the New Jersey Water Environment Association, which is actually a member association of the Water Environment Federation. Um, there, I chaired the Young Professionals Committee, where I found an unbelievable community of like-minded water professionals. Um, and as I got more involved with my member association, I also got more involved with WEF and WEF has 75 different member associations and 35,000 members. Um, I love the way that WEF brought professionals together. And now that I work for WEF as the Students and Young Professionals Manager, I have the opportunity to really continue the legacy through events like uh, the community service project. So this project aims to make a difference in the Weftec host city uh, by leaving a positive impact, not only on the local water environment um, and educating the community about the value of water. Um, it's organized completely by students and young professionals um, from all over the world. And the day really brings together over 100 passionate volunteers. Um, I've watched the creation of such an unbelievable community here um, while building bioswiles, bioswiles, rain gardens, outdoor classrooms. Um, I've also had the amazing opportunity to help bring wastewater treatment to Costa Rica um, with the Global Water Stewardship, uh, which is an organization that educates and supports Costa Rican communities uh, to create their own wastewater infrastructure within their local communities. Um, I've also had the opportunity to read our Why Water's Worth It book to some of the students there um, that was created by some of our WEF staff as well. So I've, I've had a pretty interesting career. I've done some really amazing things. That's great. I mean, the, the, the way that you are um, really demonstrating and illustrating the importance of water diplomacy, you know, even in elementary Absolutely. schools. I mean, that's really yes. where it starts. And that's uh, that educational aspect is so important. Uh, now, Rocky, you work within the government space. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your work and how you got started with that. Sure. And thanks so much again for having me as part of this panel. Um, so I've been interested in environmental issues since I was young, but I think I specifically got interested in water policy um, when I was in college. And I think it was through some of my professors and some of my classes that I really started to understand um, just how important this issue is going to be for our generation and those behind us um, and really wanted to be able to contribute any way I could. So I um, pursued a master's degree in water resource management 
And I decided to go the science track and do research as, as my focus for my master's. And I think my program was just, I was fortunate to be in a program where I could do the science, but then I also had exposure to policy, to environmental justice, and even some of the international cooperation work. And I think that's when I really started to realize that my passion was in some of that international work and in people's interactions with their environments. Um, and, and really this question about access to water and some of the things that Megan was even saying about who has access and sort of looking at you know ways to improve that. Um, so when I left graduate school, I um, was lucky to be able to get a fellowship at EPA, um, started in their national estuary program, and then about a year later moved into their international program. And I had had very little exposure to national government, um, only knew a little bit about EPA of what I had read. And just, I didn't, I didn't know how it would all go, but I, I was quickly blown away um, just by how passionate the people were, dedicated to the mission, and just how humbling it was to have an opportunity to serve serve the American public and to just come to work every day with that mission in mind. Um, and that's what I think has kept me in government um, over the last several years has just been that calling and that, that feeling of being able to serve and make a difference. Um, and I think I've had the opportunity to work now on water policy issues in so many different ways. Um, so being able to work with governments as they're working on their water monitoring systems or revising their laws, um, being able to look at women as water resource management leaders, um, really being able to look at um, ways to advance water research together and things like that with other countries. Um, and now just in September, um, I was so thrilled to have the opportunity to join NOAA and to be able to look at it from another angle, um, being able to look at ocean issues and look at the interface of ocean and climate. Um, that that aspect has been so exciting to me, and I'm just um, thrilled to be able to find ways to continue to contribute to the government. Yeah, that's really thing. I'm, one thing that I just pick up on from your comments is the importance of communication skills. You know, because mm -hmm. you have been able to look at it from so many different angles, mm -hmm. being able to communicate that and increase understanding across all of the disciplines is really a key skill set. So that's a great example of uh, somebody who is uh, approaching this from an interdisciplinary aspect. Uh, that's that's great to see. So now, Vijay, you come to us from the private sector. Uh, so tell us a little about a little bit about your work and how you got started. Sure, I started as uh, my uh, basic undergrad training is in chemical engineering. As you can see, when I started it, it was wasn't uh, connected to water at all. And uh, through my undergrad program, I did an internship in a uh, pharmaceutical industry that makes antibiotics. And when I showed up that day to the pharmaceutical industry, they said, as an intern, I, I get to work with uh, one of the departments in the back end of the facility. It happens to be, it is a wastewater treatment and recycling facility of that industry. So as you can see, Lauren mentioned my specialty today. It's uh, 20 plus years ago, I was doing the exact same thing as an intern, as doing water reuse. So it's uh, one of those things, when I started that internship, I didn't realize that will be my career. So here I am on that same path. And from there, I did my uh, master's in environmental engineering. And uh, that's kind of uh, the same theme as the interdisciplinary that Lauren and Rocky was mentioning. And uh, even at environmental engineering, I wasn't sure that I should be focusing on water or wastewater or even remediation uh, careers. And that's where I think I have a lot of commonality with the, my fellow panelists today because I was a very good uh, uh, student that's taking advantage, took advantage of all the WEF programs, even uh, when I was a student, as a grad student, they give really discounted uh, entry fees or registrations for students, I can remember. And with that, I finished my uh, master's and started working for EPA for two years and uh, took more of, uh, at that time, there was a heavy metal issues and others. So I was working on that side of things. Then more of, uh, more lately, I was focused on advanced treatment. I'll get to more throughout our discussion today where we are going after the contaminants or pathogens or germs and other hormones, pharmaceuticals, personal care products. So those kind of uh, career path took me to the West because that's where most of the uh, recycling was happening at the time. So I started a career in consulting about uh, mid last uh, decade. 
and since been working in the consulting industry, working with the one advantage I would say for working as a consultant is I get to work with uh, communities across the world and both private uh, industries and mostly uh, public cities, counties and uh, utility districts across the world. So uh, we'll happy to share more as we progress through, Laura, thanks. Okay. Yeah, we'll definitely get into that as we get uh, more into the program. So uh, what we'd like to do now is let's go into the, the, into the first part of our program. Uh, and this first part is about water diplomacy and international cooperation. Uh, now, before we get into that, we wanted to do something a little bit special for this program today. Uh, and we have been working uh, with different organizations as we prepared this program to get better insights and to ask some questions about what are some of the most important points that our viewers should know today? Uh, and one of the ways that we can communicate that is by sharing stories of young professionals who are in many cases like many of our viewers. You know, they're getting started in their careers, maybe having questions about which path they're going to take. And we're gonna share three stories today. Uh, and the first one we're going to share, uh, this is from Lynn Porta, uh, and she is from the United States. Uh, and she submitted this to us to tell her story as an example. And these are in her words, so I'm just going to read her read uh, what she sent to us. She says, I focus on international water politics and the effects of politics on management and policy choices on water resources. Uh, when I began, I was full of energy and curiosity and stubbornness, she says, uh, but without the vocabulary, the skill set, or the, the broad worldview uh, to know how to apply that energy, um, especially on issues that involved the intersection of environmental problems, conservation, uh, Middle East studies, and international relations. So again, this is a great way to illustrate the interdisciplinary aspect of water issues. Uh, she said, I had to carve my own path into programs uh, that were focused on the Middle East, uh, but as the only person that was concerned with the environmental issues, uh, while at the same time developing professional relationships with ecologists and biologists at my school. Um, she says, with my stubbornness, I attracted the attention of an early mentor uh, who helped me find the opportunities for fellowships and grants that were interdisciplinary and fit my unique interests. And one of those fellowships allowed me to focus exclusively on questions of water management, international water politics, and environmental problems. And this is the basis of her current graduate work at this time. So uh, Lynn, I'd like to thank you uh, for sending us your story so that we could share it with our viewers. Uh, and I think that's a great way for us to get into this first part of the program, talking about international cooperation. Now, today, now we're going to discuss those skills and water security and management is truly an international effort. Uh, it affects all parts of society and requires solutions that address the entire system. Um, that includes roles for government, civil society and businesses uh, among many other professions. Now, building understanding among nations and professions and citizens is a, is a key task in making progress and addressing these challenges. Uh, and a key skill set is to be able to communicate among those professional fields and disciplines uh, so that they can understand the challenges that each one faces and to, again, provide solutions that heal the entire system. Uh, and again, part of our program preparation for this uh, was to speak with professionals in each one of those disciplines. Uh, so let's turn to our panelists with a couple of questions related to that. So uh, Megan, let me start with you again. Uh, one thing we heard uh, in our conversations was that it's tough to find jobs for a lot of people. Uh, so if there is such a need for these skill sets, why do you think it is hard to find jobs? What are some of the challenges people face? So I think that we have a lot of, in our sector, we have invisible infrastructure, which means that sometimes the workforce can be invisible. Um, many, of the, many of these jobs are not very glamorous, um, especially in wastewater. Um, the public isn't necessarily educated on the important roles that we do play. Um, it's like they turn on their faucets and expect this clean water and then they tend to forget and ask where that water comes from. So I think uh, we need programs where people can really show up and get to know each other. Uh, for example, like the service project that I spoke about earlier where volunteers show up and chat and make connections while building a rain garden or bioswale or outdoor classroom. Um, I've heard of so many people that have gotten their jobs or just made these amazing connections that way. So it's really all about creating those connections with the community. 
Okay, and Rocky, um, what are you, I mean, from the government perspective, uh, it's a little bit different, I think, in the government uh, uh, sector to get into your jobs because they tend to be, um, you know, there's a longer application process, for example. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that two things come to mind immediately. Um, one, I think that because water issues are by nature, so interdisciplinary, they're not always where you'd expect or the job description isn't what you'd expect. And just as myself as an example, I've been working on water issues for nearly 15 years, but I've never really had water in my title. Um, so I may be working on this work. I may be doing this as part of my portfolio, but it may not be evident to someone who is applying to a job like mine. Um, so I think that's part of it is knowing where to look and knowing what to look for, because by nature, water could look like infrastructure. Like Megan was saying, it could look like energy. Energy. It could look like food security. It could look like livelihoods. So I think just kind of broadening your scope of what a water job may look like. I think that's one thing. And I think it's the other thing, Lauren, that exactly what you were saying. Um, I think for people like me who came into government and weren't really familiar with the process, it can be really daunting application process and sort of understanding how the process works to get in. Um, and I think we're doing a lot to be able to encourage more people to come into public sector and other sectors. Um, but I think that also can be a hurdle for some people is just really understanding the process itself. Okay, absolutely. Now, VJ, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, you come at it from the business perspective and also, a, you know, an engineering perspective as well. So uh, what is the, the level of need, do you think, in your space? And is it hard to find jobs? Or what are some of the best processes people can follow or strategies that people can follow to, to identify and learn about potential jobs? Sure. Uh, when I think about this question, I would start from, let's say, I'm running a project for a water infrastructure project and the number of disciplines that gets involved in a project. And if I, I started counting in my mind, it's more than 10 or 15 disciplines we have in each project, starting from uh, environment. When we think of water, like Rocky is saying, uh, it could be multidisciplinary. You, you may not even know you're impacting as a structural engineer, one of the largest water infrastructure in the world, because from their mind, it's a structural engineering work. But I think the water brings a lot of those disciplines comparing to other sectors. Uh, even as a, working as a private sector, uh, we uh, bring big teams, delivery teams to each of our infrastructure projects. And uh, I think I'm gonna touch on both of our uh, colleagues here that it's, uh, you need to be a little bit more uh, specific about what to look for. I think that's the first tip I would give you uh, because it could be sounds like a SCADA specialist or some, uh, you know, the, the control specialist, but it could be in the end of the day, it's uh, if you are good with uh, coding and if you're good with uh, uh, software, platforms that could be the application. So it takes a while to understand what the application or what the job is asking for. But the good thing is there is a lot of demand in water industry right now for a lot of professionals in all disciplines. And as I said, from economists to the electrical engineers to the structural engineers, we employ all these people for each of our projects to uh, move it along. So. Okay, great. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, again, in our conversations, when we prepared this program, I posed that question, um, you know, to the leader of a company uh, who is working in the water space. Uh, and I said, you know, what are some of the skill sets that we use? And they said, well, there's nothing that's not involved in, in water management in one way or another, whether it's a lawyer or an accountant or an engineer or a teacher uh, or just about anything. There's so many different ways to come at it. So um, one of the challenges we had in developing this program was trying to define what those spaces were because there are so many of them. So uh, let's move on to our next question with that in mind. Uh, and Megan, what are some, in your space in civil society, um, what are some of the best skill sets that young professionals can develop if they wanted to go into that space, do you think? Absolutely. So I'm a huge proponent of the soft skills I think are incredibly important. Um, developing your leadership skills, building that community, volunteering, um, getting to know your community, making those connections and communicating effectively. I think that's across the board, like you were saying, um, especially now in this virtual environment, leading effective meetings, time management, um, all of these will help you really just kind of shape your career. Because like you said, across the board. That's right, Rocky. From, for me, that's not technical, not a technical person at all. 
Right. It, it, it is very important. Um, you know, we manage uh, virtual programs like this all the time and we really mm -hmm. emphasize soft skills, you know, even making eye contact or just being able to articulate and speak clearly. Uh, those things have such a huge impact. So uh, now, Rocky, you deal in, in the government. And so there's a lot of regulatory uh, aspect to that, uh, a lot of cooperation among different stakeholders who have a uh, who have a stake in the different mm -hmm. regulations and policies. So yeah. what do you think are some of the best skill sets for young professionals? Um, I'd echo some of the things that Megan said that you had said earlier um, in terms of for uh, for sure communications is a big one, um, just being able to be a good communicator. And I think that's something that you continuously hone over your career. Um, and then the leadership, I think that was a really great point. I think that those are, those are really important. Um, beyond that, I, I, I sort of think about it in maybe two buckets of skills. There's, there's the sorts of the things that you do that you naturally have inclinations to. So there's some skills that you've built very naturally. And I'd say to continue to hone those. And those are some of the things that just make you shine and the things that you love to do when you go to work. And then I would, say that the other skills, um, it's really once in a while about taking a step back, looking forward to that next job or that dream job that you want to apply for and thinking about what would make me stand out, you know, and really show off my skills or what would make me stand out as a great candidate for this job. And I think just asking yourself that question every once in a while can post some interesting answers. And you may find that it is taking a technical course in statistics or GIS or economics or something like that. It, it may be doing a certification. It may be taking an internship or a volunteer opportunity, but certainly um, finding things like that, that may be just slightly outside of your comfort zone is slightly outside of something you've done before, but that could really make you the outstanding candidate that someone is looking for. Um, so I think it, it sort of goes to both of those, like doing things that are natural to you and also occasionally stretching towards something new. Okay, great. Leaving your comfort zone. That's all, always, always a good idea, I think, to go out and learn something new, especially for a space like this. Uh, again, just because of the interdisciplinary nature of it. Uh, so, Vijay, let me pose that question to you. I mean, again, you come from a, from a business side and also from an engineering and, and a technical side. Uh, so the skill sets for people in who are interested in going to, into your space are pretty well defined. I mean, these would be uh, termed as hard skills. And what are some of the things that you've already touched on this, but what are some of the skills you think that people should be should be looking at if they wanted to go into that space? Sure, Lauren. And I'll get to the, uh, you know, there is no uh, comparison that communication skills these days take over the hard skills in a way. <laughs> However, uh, just to answer Lauren's question about the, the hard skills, which is a little bit unique, then I worked in industries and other uh, work as a water consultant to various industries. I see a lot of engineering professionals employed by huge industries here uh, across the world. However, in water industry, we expect them to be a professional engineer, and which is very unique if you think about it. Even the electrical engineer have to have this professional engineering license in water professionals. So I would encourage, uh, even if you are in uh, grad school or undergrad program right now, there are uh, states such as Nevada where you can even take the professional engineering exam and be done with it and then get your experience and then get licensed. So that's uh, definitely, that's my, no matter what's your discipline in the engineering, you should strive to get that. Uh, and my own personal experience, I, I, as I shared with you, uh, I started as a chemical engineer, but my professional engineering license is in civil engineering. So it took me a while to make that shift and learn and uh, gain the experience and appear for that exam and get that licensure. But still, I think uh, that's one of those uh, key points that I would like to make. It's not a like a skill that you can really go and gain. It takes a while, but you need to make an effort from day one when you're uh, interested, if you're interested in water industry, especially as a designer or the, the consulting professional, that's one. And on top of it, I think uh, both of, uh, uh, our panelists mentioned about writing and speaking skills, uh, which we uh, train a, our team every day on those uh, soft skills that's re really recommended because it's a lot of reporting. That's what happens before we get to do the project. We have to uh, develop so many of those uh, documents. Okay, great. Yeah, that it's interesting because the three of you do come at this from different angles, you know, civil society, government, and, and the private sector. Now, one thing that I've read a lot is that 
um, the importance of being able to have an interdisciplinary skill set. Uh, and a lot of times this has been turned as a, a, a renaissance man, you know, somebody who is not necessarily specialized in any one field, but kind of understands everything and kind of sees the big picture. Uh, so let me just ask each one of you in turn, and VJ, I'm going to start with you just to kind of piggyback off your comments there. Do you see a role for those type of people in your organization uh, or in your space? You know, somebody who can basically their skill set is to combine all the different aspects and be able to communicate that out to different stakeholders. Absolutely. I think uh, there, I think uh, Megan started off this uh, whole session with these titles could be misleading sometimes because in water industry, we call the exact professional that you explained, uh, Lauren, as project managers. Because we hand, uh, let's say, $100 million infrastructure project in their hands to deliver it. And their main role is to make sure from rate studies, that's where the economist comes in picture, they have to make sure uh, the, the, the utilities were able to pay and the rate structures and everything is good until the operations startup and commissioning where we bring the operators to make sure it's almost like they're getting a new uh, car almost. It's a very expensive uh, piece of equipment. They are gonna take over and keep it as their own system. So we train the operators in the end. The, the commonality, the reason I, and all the engineering discipline comes in the middle, but as a project manager, you have to think through all these steps and make sure the good project managers bring that skill set of bringing the right people and doing the right moves. As the, as you said, the big picture, they are a little bit of generalist, but they are a, a very, how do you say, precious commodity in the water industry, I would say. <laughs> Right. Now, Rocky, let me, pay, let me pose the same question for you. I mean, again, and I, I would assume that in your space, because you are different, dealing with so many different stakeholders, that being able to see the big, big picture is a, is a great skill. Yeah, I think I think we have both. I think, you know, in the type of work that I do, it, you're right that we dabble in a lot of the technical issues and need to understand a little bit, but need to be able to make those connections and then effectively communicate those to our stakeholders. Um, and I think that, you know, we have people that are subject matter experts that get really deep into a particular subject and we rely on them heavily in order to make make those communications, make those projects effective. So I think, I think we have both. Um, a lot of my work has really been in that sort of broader making the connections between different disciplines and making those programs go but I, I think in the government you really you need both for sure okay great and and Megan I know that you appreciate the um, the value of soft skills and being, being able to communicate we saw that in action when you were reading the book to the elementary school children in Costa Rica so uh, but let me tell let me tell um, ask you that same question I mean being able to see the bigger picture because you do work in civil society but the work that you do is also impacting the um, you know, the, the per perceptions that people have about regulation and some of the technical aspects of water. Absolutely. And I think like for me and Rocky and Vijay were kind of touching on this, like I don't come from that technical field and trying to get into water was, I kind of struggled kind of, kind of trying to find where I kind of fell in there. Uh, but I found that for me, I've kind of worked as a connector from these the stakeholders and the technical people and the non-technical people, because there's so many different professions throughout water. I mean, you can be in water through business development, marketing, sales, operations. You could be a scientist, a biologist, um, an academic. Um, so that's kind of where I bring everyone together and connect them and kind of help them make those connections themselves. So um, there's, there's always a place for, for you in this, in this sector, which I, I tell people all the time. It might take a little bit of time to find it, but it is there for you. There are endless possibilities. Okay, great. Now, in part two, we're going to get more into detail on that, about some of the career development strategies uh, that young professionals can use. But before we do that, we're going to take a couple of questions from our audience. Now, one of our viewers asks, um, internships are often seen as a key pathway to enter the water sector, but can be hard to find. We kind of touched upon this before. Um, what other kinds of experiences do you think are valuable for young professionals to have? You know, if there's internships that are not available, for example, what are some other things that, that they can do? Megan, let me start with you. Um, I think 
If there's no internships, I mean, getting involved in another professional organization, um, finding opportunities that way, um, getting involved um, with like a, a stream cleanup or a different group, an environmental group, and kind of networking there and finding other opportunities that way, going international, see if you can find um, an organization that does some kind of international work and kind of finding ways um, to get plugged in there. So there's there's so many different ways. And again, like I was saying, there's so many um, careers within water. So maybe thinking, okay, I couldn't find an internship at this engineering firm. Maybe I look to see if there's something in marketing, if there's something at a wastewater treatment plant, um, if there's something within water policy. So kind of broadening that search instead of just being super focused in on, on a specific thing. Okay, great. So keeping your options open and having an open Absolutely. mind to see what comes, comes through. Okay. Uh, now, Rocky, for, for you in the, in the government sector, um, when there are not any, in, when there are no internships and people want to get involved in that, maybe a more regulatory space or stakeholder management space, what are some of the opportunities you could say are, are available? I think that's a good question. I'd, I'd echo what Megan said in terms of finding opportunities to volunteer, or maybe a project abroad or things like that. Um, another thing that comes to mind, and I think this is where your community of folks that you know and maybe your mentors comes into play, is if you're interested in a particular government office, um, finding someone that you might be able to shadow for a day or just get to understand their work a little bit better or even just sit down with them for half an hour, 45 minutes to learn more about their work. Um, that's a great way just to get to know their career path and get to know what worked for them and also for them to to get to know you. Um, and I found that people are really generous with their time when you reach out for that sort of thing. Um, so again, like using your network in order to find people that are doing this kind of work and getting a chance to shadow them or talk with them or maybe support them on a particular project. Um, that's another thing that comes to mind for me. Okay, and, and Vijay, the same question to you. And again, coming from the technical and a, like an engineering perspective, if somebody wants to uh, you know, get involved in that space and learn more about it. Are there internships available? Uh, and if not, where, what are some of the ways that they can get more experience and find out more about that space? Sure, absolutely. I think uh, internship is uh, a key part of our strategy on uh, finding the right talent uh, because it gives a very good experience for our team to get to know them more in a long, prolonged couple of months or more than that. Uh, in a summer, let's say, summer internship. So we encourage uh, internship as much as uh, we can and emphasize it and bring the right folks into the right offices. And uh, just to help that uh, audience about the question, if they try, let's say, a certain route, and if they're not able to get the right internship, and I think both Megan and Rocky mentioned it, you should uh, not, um, I think, stop that search because you can, as uh, Megan said, you, that is uh, wastewater treatment plants is in every community and water treatment plants are in every community and they do employ interns. I have met so many of the young professionals through that program because it's mainly a city sponsored program. So there is a Western interest from the community to train you in a way. And uh, as Megan and I, we know, <laughs> There is a, always we are looking for new talent to be added to this operational side because there is more I can touch on like in recycling. We are even creating a new uh, realm of operators for the future, what we call it as an advanced treatment operators. So like the traditional, there is a traditional groups and we are even developing new, new career paths. So never uh, stop from one angle. And the last uh, idea I would give is, uh, the industries, don't forget the industries in your area because they do uh, water, because they come from a compliance of water. And they also have an issue with uh, uh, water compliance and treatment. So they need interns to help them. So look from all angles. That's uh, what I would say. Yeah, that's a great point in that um, one thing, because the water sector is changing and we have a lot of impacts from climate change that are becoming increasingly clear, uh, one thing to consider is that a lot of the jobs in the water sector have not been created yet. And so we, are, we really do need young professionals with ideas and who can communicate well uh, to look around and be innovative and be creative and not just go out and find a job, but actually create jobs. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a key thing, a key skill set as well and something to consider. So 
Uh, okay, we're going to move on to the second part of our program now, uh, where we're going to talk more about career development for young professionals. Uh, now, before we do that, I'd like to share another story uh, about career development. And let's take a look at, at um, Adolfo Romero. And uh, he is from Mexico. Uh, and he sent us his stories. And he says that studying physics may be the biggest challenge of my life. Uh, and the reason why is because the universe has always awakened our curiosity and desire to uncover, uncover its beauty and complexity. Uh, now, for, for me, the study of everything in physics, from, from atoms all the way to planets, planets and galaxies, is fascinating. Uh, sometimes it has seemed overwhelming and confusing. Uh, but a few years back, uh, I discovered the Stockholm International Junior Water Prize. Uh, and I found that working on water issues was a great place to apply my science skills and inspire others to do the same. Uh, and after representing Mexico in 2014, uh, I'm devoted to inspiring more people to create a better future. Uh, so again, here's another example of uh, somebody, and thank you Adolfo for sending that in, uh, who is, is approaching this from a science angle, but there's so many different ways that you can apply that. Uh, and so as we get into our second part of our program, we're going to talk more about some of the steps that young professionals can take to develop a career path in the water profession, some of the more practical steps. Now, the main points we're going to discuss are first, how to develop a professional community. Uh, and second, what are some of the resources that are available for young professionals? Uh, now, again, in our conversations and preparing this program, we had a couple of key insights. Uh, the first one that we noticed is that technology uh, has had a big impact on how people connect with each other and also how they develop professional relationships. So when you think about that, you can think of things like LinkedIn, you know, how do you connect with people through social media? Uh, and another point is that because the water profession is so diverse with so many different actors, mentor programs are very valuable in helping young professionals make sense of what career paths are available. Uh, so let's talk to our panelists once again about those questions. So Megan, let me start with you. Um, how would you go? How would you advise somebody to establish a professional community within the water context? And you know, what has been your What has been your experience with that? I would definitely suggest uh, um, getting involved, whether that be joining a professional association, an organization in the sector, a cleanup, a social event in your area that draws other students and young professionals. Uh, for me, for my story, uh, becoming a part of the WEF community through the New Jersey WEA honestly changed the trajectory of my career. Um, I like to tell this story. I remember being at the annual conference and I was at my booth because I was doing marketing and business development. And one of my friends who worked for our electrical sub consultant came by and asked me to attend a YP meeting that afternoon with her. I was like, YP, what does that mean? Um, it's like, okay, sure, I'll, I'll definitely try it out. So I went and signed up to be a part of the committee. Uh, I met some really great people there, became very involved with various young professional subcommittees uh, and was elected as co-chair and then chair of the New Jersey WEA Young Professionals. Um, that year, the association then sent me to the YP Summit, which is a joint leadership conference. Um, that year, it was held in Austin, Texas, and I met so many incredibly like-minded and passionate professionals during my time there at the summit. By the end of the day, it's like, I know this is where I want to be. This is the sector that I want to be in. This is the work that I want to do. Um, and I did struggle a little bit with that because I wasn't an engineer or an operator or didn't have any of that technical experience that put me specifically into the sector. But like I had stated before, there's so many ways to be involved, whether that's through business development, operations, academics, there's just an endless number of options to be involved. So it's kind of come full circle now that I have the opportunity through WEF uh, to create a space for YPs to learn and to grow as leaders and connect and facilitate conversations between these volunteers at wherever they may be in the sector and create a space to confront various water issues. Absolutely, and I think that kind of comes back to what we were talking about before about the importance of 
being able to see the big picture, you know, mm -hmm. and, and again, even creating a job. So, so for yeah. those of our viewers out there who do not have a PhD in chemistry or, or something like this, don't be intimidated. You know, it's, it's really great to join these organizations and just learn and ask questions because there are opportunities out there. Uh, so Rocky, let me ask you the same question. I mean, within the government, for example, if you wanted to get more into the policy side of things, uh, what are mm -hmm. some of the best ways to establish a, a professional community? Yeah, I, I love what Megan had to say about just getting involved. I think that that's just it, you know, jump into projects that are of interest to you, offer to help, offer to support them. Um, I think, you know, it's, there's there's multiple things you can do once you're so when you're first starting out and starting to build your network again it may be relying on alumni networks it may be joining new um, organizations when i first moved to dc um i just tried to look around and see you know are there organizations that i could volunteer with or other groups i could become involved with there was a great group for young women environmental professionals and that was perfect you know for something that i knew that i was interested in joining and then also got involved volunteering with a great organization water for people and that sort of got me started in building my network and then kind Coming into the professional space, I think it just kind of cascades over time. Um, you, you start to see people at meetings and at conferences, they get to know and love your work. Um, and I think you just start to build these relationships over time. Um, and I think it's about finding ways to be helpful to people um, and in a genuine way, you know, really helping people make connections, helping them get their work done, um, helping, encouraging people and supporting them when you can. And I think that's part of what builds your professional community over time. Um, I think you start to you start to sort of see people as part of your community of people you rely on as you're taking on a new project or taking on a new opportunity. Um, and I think mentors can really help you with that. They can open up new doors. They can help encourage you to you know go apply for that job or to do that sort of thing. So I think it's all of those things in building your network. Right, absolutely. Mentors are, are such an important aspect of that because you can learn a lot about it in school, but when you go talk to somebody and they're actually working in the field and they say, okay, this is how we actually do things and this, this is how things get done, uh, it, there's always the, the intangibles, like you said, uh, that, make a, that make a huge impact. So now, VJ, coming from the business side, uh, what are some of the best ways in your space that in your experience uh, in terms of building a professional community? Sure, I think I'm going to piggyback on both Megan and Rocky on this because it's the same template. And I would say I always compare our industry to others just to see where how we do things. And I can tell this is more like a family. When you come to, into, and not cross-pollinate that much between, let's say, your drinking water specialist versus water, wastewater specialist. But once you get into that realm of, let's say, you're going, going to a local section meeting on, as Megan said, that's uh, your state section or even more of your city's uh, local section meeting. They become a, more of a family because they are having a vested interest for you to succeed. And if you, as Rocky said, they are very, very uh, uh, open to committing their own time to help you uh, answer your questions or sit down and talk about your career path. So. I think that the first effort is you need to look for those opportunities and volunteer or even just show up and participate. I think uh, that will uh, open your eyes and I can speak from my own uh, experience that I was in Cincinnati as a student and I had a lot of mentors from the consulting business at the time and they were not even, uh, I, I told them clearly, I wasn't even planning on joining their firm, but it didn't stop them from helping me answer my question. So I think that's the uniqueness that we have in the water industry that other industry cannot claim. That uh, I think by nature, they are very uh, helpful crowd that we are having, so. Absolutely, and I, I think one other important point to make, and this kind of goes back to the beginning part of our discussion is, you know, how do you find jobs? And this is really one of the best ways to find jobs is just becoming part of your community, going out and asking questions. And really it's about positioning yourself, you know, to put yourself in a position to where when somebody thinks, well, I need somebody who is curious and is innovative for this position, who do I think about and who do I want to apply for that job? Uh, if you are known to this person and you have asked them questions, you've demonstrated your interest, they're going to think of you first. Uh, so that's a, that's a big point to make. And I think very important for any young professional uh, who wants to get into whether it's the water space or dealing with climate change and all the different disciplines that go into that is to posi position yourself, you know, make yourself known uh, by asking questions and getting involved. So 
Uh, let, let's go on to the second question here uh, in, in terms of um, the developing your career. Uh, and Megan, let, again, let me start with you. What are some of the specific programs and approaches that are being used uh, in your organization to help raise awareness of career paths? So we have so many. I narrowed it down to a few that came to the top of my mind, um, but I would definitely say the Water Leadership Institute. Um, it's a program that's aimed at educating and developing the emerging leaders within the sector and building stronger connections with other, other water professionals throughout the sector. Um, I was actually class of 2019 and it was such an unbelievable experience. Um, we have our mentorship program. Um, and I think like we were talking about having a mentor is so important within the sector. And it doesn't even have to be, say, if you're a consultant, another consultant, you could go have a, a mentor that's in operations or in something completely different, just so you can kind of learn different skills. Um, we have the YP Summit, which is a joint leadership event where YPs can network and talk about emerging issues within the sector. Um, and then we also have a lot of programs for students, like the student design competition, which gives students real world design experience. So lots okay. of really great stuff for both students and professionals. Okay, great. Now, Rocky, again, coming from, from, from the government angle, uh, and again, focusing on policy, what are some of the approaches that you use to raise awareness for people and some of the skills they might need to build uh, to apply for jobs and succeed in that space? Yeah, I think it's so for, I guess, government at large and thinking specifically about EPA and NOAA, since that's when I have, where I have the most experience, they have a range of programs that are fellowships or internships um, geared towards giving people a taste of what it's like to work in the public sector. Um, so there may be programs for students to spend a summer, there may be programs to reach out to historically underrepresented groups of people to be able to bring into the public sector that we don't have currently. So I've been excited to see that, that, the, you know, we're trying to cast a wider net and bring more people into public sector. So I think certainly those opportunities are there. And then once you get into government, I've been really excited over the last several years to see the number of innovative mentoring programs that have popped up and also um, skill exchange programs where you may be new to government and you're in one particular office, but if your manager agrees, you can spend a certain amount of your time working on a project for another office. And it's such a great way to build your network, to get a chance to do something different and just to expand your knowledge of, of that organization. Um, so I've been, I've just um, been really heartened by that. And I think in terms of reaching out to youth, I was, I was thinking about this a little bit. Um, I think we're just doing more around bringing youth to the table as stakeholders and conversations, offering challenges and innovation prizes that are specific um, to youth or people who are early in their careers, um, and then trying to engage more on social media and uh, in other ways to connect things like this, you know, where you can connect even if you're not physically in the same place. So I, I think there's a range of things that, you know, organizations are starting to offer in the public sector. Okay, that's great. And obviously, I mean, young people, if you look at uh, polling and, and a lot of other um, media sources, that they are increasingly concerned about things like climate change and water security. Uh, so reaching out to them is, uh, again, a great idea. And uh, there's a lot of demand for that. So let me kind of pose the, the same question to VJ. And VJ, you had told said before that there is a lot of demand, you know, for technical mm -hmm. skills uh, on the business side. So what are some of the programs and approaches that uh, your organization and your sector is using to, to cultivate and build that talent to bring them in into that space? Yeah. I think uh, within the consulting space, I'll start from there and then we can open up to a uh, few other private sector uh, rounds. Within consulting, it's not just AECOM, the, where our organization, I think all the major consulting firms, the one big change I see is uh, flexibility. So there was uh, like five years ago, there was, or 10 years ago, there was a flexible working model where you can, uh, you have a flexible hours. Now, I think uh, the, the important change I see is uh, it's a flexible career path. So if you look from traditional civil engineering career paths, you become one of those, let's say, a pump station specialist. And people I have seen, they retire as a pump station specialist after 40 years of experience. I think that's changing for a good reason where uh, now, as Rocky said in the government side, even in the private side, we are making a lot of effort to make it flexible. So that let's say you try to be, a, again, as a detailed design person of something uh, like a dam. So I keep giving you an example on the treatment plant. So I'll give you a dam example, build a hydraulic structure, and then you realize, hey, I'm probably more interested in water quality. 
we are making those paths within our organization so you can uh, transfer to a project or roles where you can learn the, the water quality issues because you became more pas passionate or you're more curious about that. So I think it's a very big change if you ask me in the, in the industry because uh, things are getting in a better way where there is more flexible options and, and another important uh, uh, areas where we are uh, uh, encouraging this is just because you're transferring from one career path to another, it is not gonna impact your advancement of your career. So that's a, another one where we don't wanna penalize people for exploring their minds. We are actually in the other way, encouraging them to start thinking, what are you really passionate about? Let's go after that area. So I think uh, things are, the environment is good. It's uh, like I said, it's not just my organization. I see it in multiple other organizations uh, doing the same. They are coming around with this idea of empowering people, uh, their own uh, people with whatever they are passionate about. Again, that's interesting. And one of the points that uh, I got from our discussions, again, in preparing this program, was that you see a lot of people who start out on the science side of water, for example, but then they look at it and they say, well, maybe I want to go more on the education side, or maybe you want to do more on policy. And there was a big discussion about how do you enable people to take their skill sets that have been built in you know, five or 10 years and on the science side, they want to go apply that on the educational side. So just to kind of further that discussion, Megan, let me ask you, I mean, do you see that? And do you see a demand for that where people who have specialized in one, it would be a viable and, and successful choice for them to go transfer into another career path, into education, for example? Oh, absolutely. I see that all the time and kind of touching on what Vijay said before about the water sector is a family. It's a community. People want to help you. So if someone sees that you're super passionate about something else, they want to help you get to where you want to be. And there is a place for you to do that. So kind of leaning on your network, finding a mentor that can, that might be in that specific area to help you get to where you need to be. But I totally agree when VJ said this is a family, this is a community, and we are all working towards the same goal. Yeah, and, and Rocky, the, the same question to you, especially because you mentioned skill exchanges, you know, a, a formal program to have people actually go out and learn, you know, the different disciplines so they can understand each other. Do, do you see that a lot? And do you see a role for that where people can go and work in different disciplines and not only learn themselves, but make a contribution to the different spaces that they're working in? Yeah, I, I definitely do. I'm seeing that a lot more over the last several years. And I think it's a really promising trend because I found that when these people, for example, if you have a hard science skill and now you're taking a stint in a communications role, um, it actually benefits both. It benefits the communications office where you're landing because they're getting a whole nother perspective. And now you have a person with this technical background who's getting a chance to really focus in on communication. So I, I found that the organization as a whole just gets stronger when you offer these kinds of opportunities and everyone around them benefits. And I think, you know, it's so easy when you're in a particular part of a particular organization to get stuck in those norms and just having that fresh thinking, someone who's coming at it from a different angle. It's not always easy, but I think in the end, everyone benefits from that kind of, that kind of experience. Okay, great. Uh, that's a great thought to move on to the third part of our program. And we're going to talk a little bit more about now about workforce development and some of the expectations that we might have for the future. Uh, and to do that, I want to share one final story uh, from somebody who had written in to us. And this is Lena Timberg, uh, and she is from Canada. Uh, and she said that she became interested in water issues in high school uh, when she attended a conference on whether water should be a human right or a commodity. Uh, now, throughout her undergraduate studies in college, uh, she focused on different water-related topics, including indigenous sovereignty over traditional waters and environmental policy. Uh, after finishing her degree, uh, she worked for Waterlution as a youth programs coordinator for their Canada-wide youth projects. Uh, and she's now working on a project called Young Water Speaks, uh, and this is a storytelling contest that allows youth to learn about local waterways and how to create stories to share in a traveling in a traveling exhibition. So very a uh, big emphasis on communication skills there. Uh, and Lena is also the co-founder and Canadian president 
of the North American Youth Parliament for Water. So be sure to check them out online. Uh, thank you, Lena, for submitting that to us. We really appreciate that. Uh, now, in this final part of the program, we're going to take a look ahead and see what the career paths in the water profession might look like in the coming years. Uh, now, as, as we've said previously, technology has a big impact in terms of how we work and where we can work. Uh, now, over the past year, uh, because of the pandemic, we've seen this in action. Uh, and we're going to take a look now at how workforces interact with each other, because a lot of us are working remotely, uh, and how they may develop in the future. Uh, so let's turn to our panelists once again uh, for some insight on those questions. Uh, so Megan, let me start with you. Um, what are some of the major trends that you see in your field over, say, the next three years or in the next five years? So the first thing that really came to mind for me is that there's a silver tsunami happening, like the older workforce is retiring and we're going to need the younger generation of leaders to step up into their roles. So bringing that new knowledge into their roles um, and then onboarding non-college and I think vocational candidates candidates. Gen Z is a lot more willing than ever to skip college and a four-year degree. And there's various programs such as the National Green Infrastructure Certification Program, which are pulling people into the water workforce um, and providing skills for workers to construct and inspect various green infrastructure projects. Okay. And, and Rocky, the, the same question to you. I mean, what are some of the, some, some of the trends and major, some of the major demands that you see on the policy and, uh, and the government side? Yeah, I, I think that's it's some of the things that we've been talking about. I don't think these are new things, but certainly will accelerate over the next three to five years. So one thing I think would be the interdisciplinary nature of this work. So I think people making st even stronger connections between water work or what we've traditionally called water work and things like food security, energy, climate. So people working more closely together rather than in separate groups working on these issues. So I think we're just going to see a more deepening of those connections. And I think we've started to see that for some time and it's just going to accelerate over the next few years. Um, I think um, the other thing that I've noticed is more um, meaningful stakeholder involvement. And I think as we go through government processes or policy development, finding more more meaningful ways to have stakeholder input into these processes and these decisions. And I think, again, that's something that's been happening, but I think people are calling for it even more. And I think there's more venues in order to do that meaningfully. And so I think especially people who have been underrepresented at the table, there's going to be a real opportunity to bring more people to the table and have more meaningful conversations and hopefully better outcomes when it comes to water. Absolutely. And as Deputy Assistant Secretary Tom Thompson said at the top of the program, uh, these are sectors that impact uh, everywhere, energy, water, agriculture, food security. Uh, again, those inter interdisciplinary skill sets are so important and being, un being able to understand the challenges and impacts in, of each one of those sectors is a very important thing. So uh, VJ, in terms of what you're seeing, uh, you're, you're in a very involved in a very technology heavy space in the private sector and engineering. So what are some of the major trends you see coming over the next three to five years in yours, in your profession? Sure, Lauren. I think it's, uh, it's, I work with one aspect of what I'm about to say is uh, the recovering uh, nutrients, water, energy, and uh, squeezing out more efficiency in a good way because uh, water has been in several communities, has been seen as a utility that's been there forever. Like Megan said, nobody really think about where the water is coming in and where it's going once you uh, flush it. So I think we started taking a very, as an industry, very close look at, I was working with uh, Megan's organization, WEF, on a, a roadmap called Reuse Roadmap, Water Reuse Roadmap, where we uh, help communities, if you are interested in doing reuse programs in the, in the near future, what are the business uh, or the models that work with, I call it as a maturity model, where which communities have done it, and how your community can utilize it. So that's what this uh, publication is all about. It's, as I said, that's a one aspect of recovering water from the wastewater, because I think as we uh, see a growth in population and the climate change, resiliency becomes a big piece of this discussion. And I can speak from my own experience, having, let's say you're doing a reuse in your own community, you could add up to in certain communities where we are working in Southern California, the reuse could add about 33% of your water supply. So that means you took care of one third of your supply, you secured it for 
foreseeable future for even future generations with this reuse projects. So that's a trend I see where, like you said, some of these opportunities are not even generated yet. <laughs> so that's, uh, we want to keep that door open. It's not, we haven't done all these projects that we could uh, think of right now. Absolutely. You know, that's something that I've read quite a bit is that most of the jobs have not been created yet when you look 10 years down the road. Yeah. Uh, and especially as you do see increasing impacts of climate change and you do see some of the uh, the needs to address things like food security and water security, because they all they all impact each other. Uh, so having, again, those interdisciplinary skill sets and be able to communicate those, uh, those are very important uh, skill sets to have in water diplomacy or technology or, or whatever it happens to be. So uh, we are going to move on now and take some questions from our audience. And so we thank everybody for tuning in today. Now, Andrina asks, what advice would you give someone who is looking for a career change to the wash industry? So that would be water, sanitation, and hygiene. Uh, now, Megan, let me go ahead and start with you on that question. I mean, have you done any work with your with the civil society and educational side on water sanitation? And what advice would you give some to somebody who was looking to get into that space? What are some of the skills that that, that would be best uh, that, that that would best serve them? Absolutely. I mean, just like I said, all of those soft skills, trying to network to find that community where you could actually you could participate with um, with Wash. I mean, for me. Global Water Stewardship, um, and WEF has various other programs there. Um, but just again, using using that network that you have to find um, people in that space, and then kind of networking through there to to find kind of what you would like to do within that space. I think that's really important. Okay, and Rocky, the same question to you. I mean, this is something that uh, is a big focus of water diplomacy, for example, because a lot of people is is. Um, um, Mr. Thompson said at the top, they do lack sanitation and access to, to water. Uh, and so from your side, from the government side, how do you reach out to people? What are some of the paths that they can take to, to learn more about that? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. Um, I would echo what Megan said in terms of, um, you know, doing your research and especially within the government, there are several programs that focus on WASH and in different ways that some are more focused on the health aspects, some are more focused on the access to water, some places are focused more on water quality. So really trying to look, you know, whether it's EPA or USAID or NOAA or others. Um, it, it, it's about, or even State Department, looking and seeing where are the places that are doing this work and then just trying to find ways to meet people and learn about their programs. Um, I think what can be daunting is just that there, there are so many different ways or avenues to, to approach this work, but I agree with Megan, just sort of navigating that and um, trying to work on the skill sets that you think you'll need to be successful for that. Okay, and, and VJ, the same question to you, especially coming at it from a business side. Um, one thing that's important to uh, emphasize is that there are a lot of businesses who are looking at things like sanitation and clean water uh, because it is important to their operations. Uh, and so coming at it from that angle, what advice would you give to somebody who was looking to get more involved in the sanitation or the accessibility side of the water, water equation? I would say uh, if I think the, the question is from... Uh, somebody that has some skill set already developed and has some interest, then only they ask these questions because the people coming to the wash or uh, the water sustainability industry has always, I have seen, they bring a passion with them. Uh, it's not one of those uh, financial sector where they come for <laughs> other reasons. So if once you have that passion, uh, you have to identify what kind of impact you want to make with your work. I think that's very important because uh, we can always build around that passion, in my opinion. I'll give you an example. You could be a planner, where as uh, we are talking about, uh, let's say how to make, the, as Rocky rightly pointed, there is the energy, food, and water nexus happening, has to happen, and we haven't figured out that puzzle in a way that can be templated or taken everywhere in the world right now, I would say. There are some communities that are much farther along in the planning than others, but that's an area if you're more passionate about how to solve these interactions between multiple sectors, that's one area for planning. 
but let's say like me if you want me uh, if you want to implement it then you can shift on more implementation side on once we figured out the plan how are we going to build it how cost effectively we can reliably we can implement it so i think it's there is a lot of uh, opportunities i would say uh, from this area that a person is interested in within that i would say uh, spend a little bit time thinking about where the, your passion lies on planning implementation or risk assessment or there is multiple way you can address it and build on your skills you already have also because that makes you a little bit easier in your career path absolutely build on the skills that you have and again because there are so many different ways you can come at this uh, you can also switch into something later on if you find something that's more interesting or more suited to your skill set. Uh, so don't be afraid just to jump in and explore uh, at this point when you're trying to build those skill sets. Uh, so let's uh, let's take another question. Now, this is from Brendan. Uh, and the question is, has the current pandemic changed the skill set needed when looking for a job in the water resource sector? Uh, and how has the pandemic changed your work? And I think we can all say that it's changed our work. Uh, quite a bit, but uh, let, let's, let me just go ahead and, and ask that to each one of you. Megan, how has the pandemic impacted you and how has it shifted your, your workflows, for example? Oh man, I've, we've had to pivot completely, but I think there's a lot of beauty in that. I mean, it's proved to us that we can make that switch. Um, and as much as it's been difficult to network and interact in this pandemic, um, I think the virtual setting has really allowed a lot of our programs to reach so many more people than they would have. Um, many students and young professionals that I see, and I was one of them, didn't have the means to travel to events and conferences or because they're just really starting out in their careers. Um, so they might not make the travel list within their company. So we've been able to reach hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of more people than before worldwide. Like for example, I, I'm working on a program now um, and our in-person would have brought between 60 to 70 people out. And we currently have about 200 people signed up for it. So just being able to reach so many other people and patting yourself on the back for being able to pivot. I think that's really important, not kind of looking at this as, oh, this has been so hard, but oh my gosh, look what I have created, look at what I've learned. So right, Ab that. absolutely. And being able to look at a difficult situation, but then pivot and say, okay, what? how can I you know, turn this to my advantage in some way? Uh, so I can say that because virtual programming, of course, has become much more popular uh, and we're able to reach a lot of people this way. And so uh, we're seeing now that it's becoming a, a core part of communications practice is being able to, pre to present and communicate online. So uh, now, Rocky, the same thing, the same question to you. And you had mentioned the importance of stakeholder engagement. Now, obviously, that involves communication and developing relationships and understanding uh, how has the pandemic impacted you and, and what do you see maybe will be the effects on the future? Yeah, I, so I think in the first part of last year, it certainly impacted. We had a series of programs planned with some of our partners in Southeast Asia, um, and they were intended to be in-person workshops and consultations. And we really had to rethink, can we do this virtually? And then given the time difference and access to the internet and things like that, like how can we be creative but not exclude people in the process of doing that. So I think it's it's it started some really good conversations that I think, as Megan said, will ultimately lead to good outcomes if more people are able to participate. Um, there's a richer conversation that can happen there. Um, the second half of the year has been interesting because I joined NOAA at the end of September and I've been fully virtual since I've started. So I've started a brand new job um, and been entirely virtual. So just meeting new people, um, starting to build those connections virtually, I think has been a whole nother realm. Um, and I people have been gracious and just really warm and welcoming and friendly. And um, I'm so grateful for that. Um, and I think it's really made me rethink, um, how do we do work? How do we build relationships meaningfully in this kind of an environment? Um, so I think that for me on a personal note, it, it's been it's been sort of a different kind of shift. Um, and one of the things that's been promising is my current work involves a lot of international meetings and um, discussions and negotiations and seeing how those organizations have shifted to going virtual and what that can mean for how we rethink those kinds of meetings in the future is, is a really interesting thing. I, I don't think we'll ever replace the value of face-to-face -face conversation and face-to-face -face meetings, um, but I think there may be some creative things that we'll be doing in the end. Absolutely. And now, Vijay, for you, I mean, this is an interesting question because, again, of the technical side of, um, of, of your work and 
how you're communicating virtually. So how has that impacted your work? And what do you think will be the impact in the future? Are you going to do more things that are going to be virtual? Or how, how, how do you see that playing out? I think uh, as Rocky uh, ended her discussion, I think it's going to be hybrid because we cannot uh, uh, you know, overlook the uh, importance of personal connection uh, in our, you know, in any industry, that's very important. I'm, I'm a big ba fan of balancing that, but let's talk from the, what it taught us is uh, now we could work in, uh, especially this, I think this question is coming from what changed. I think it's, uh, there is a lot of positive change uh, that happened because now we can uh, work in, uh, in large organizations such as ACOM where we have uh, people connecting from across the world on each projects. So it opened a lot of doors, I would say. It's on a more on the positive side. And especially uh, comparing to a few other uh, teams, our teams is all over the world. And uh, still the time zones are a problem. We cannot over <laughs> fix that one because I try to uh, uh, have a live meeting and there are some countries that are midnight. So we don't wanna you know, have them <laughs> be awake all night. But at the same time, uh, once we work around the time zone issues, I think this virtual uh, workspace is a very positive uh, trend, I would say. The other one, just to uh, clarify, kind of open up for opportunities in the utility sector is with the pandemic, because there is a question about pandemic and we are a part of an essential industry where you have to have a water and wastewater for a thriving community, reliable water source. What we found was that the operators were being rotated out because they don't want to put all of them in the same shift because what if there is some kind of a infection happens or some uh, issues happens throughout those. So they started rotating. What it forced us is to rely on a lot of, uh, how do we call as a digital twins and uh, having uh, opened up quite a bit of innovation in the hard, reliable, uh, automation and controls. So that's more to come, Lauren. I think uh, we are just seeing the start of it and a lot of uh, utilities are interested in modernizing their systems uh, right now. So. Okay, absolutely. And as the, um, the importance of water conservation and water resources management, uh, again, because of climate change and other factors, as that becomes increasingly important, I think you'll see a lot of technology being applied uh, for those solutions. So uh, let's go on to another question. Uh, now, Mike is in Cape Town, South Africa, and he asks, how do developing countries engage in this space? And are there international pro programs to foster career development? Now, Megan, I know that you have been down to Costa Rica. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about this and your experience and how you're engaging with the developing countries and what are some of the needs and some of the priorities that you see uh, that could really help uh, increase understanding and make progress on those things. Absolutely. So yeah, even through WEF, so WEF is an international organization. So um, we are involved with many different aspects, but as far as global water stewardship, um, there are like Water for People, Global Water Stewardship, many other organizations that you can get involved with, Engineers Without Borders, um, if you're looking for more of that international feel. Um, and they're all very different. It just really depends what you're looking for. Like as for Costa Rica and the GWS, um, we have a little bit of a different model where we go in um, and we empower and we educate the communities to build their, their own wastewater infrastructure because they only have potable water there. So if you're looking for something along those lines, um, you could definitely get involved in an organization like that or going through Water for People or Engineers Without Borders where you're going in and building some type of structure. So um, there are many organizations that have different chapters of Engineers Without Borders. So um, it really just depends what kind of work that you're looking for, but there are organizations that do many things out there. Okay, great. Now, Rocky, uh, again, because of the importance of water diplomacy and the international aspect of, of these issues, I mean, um, at NOAA, what are some of the ways that you are engaging with, uh, with uh, developing countries? Or what are some of the programs and examples and ways that people can learn more and get involved uh, to make an impact? 
I, I think there's a few things that come to mind. So I think we certainly do engage with specific countries on particular technical issues. Um, so there may be opportunities where a country comes, you know, comes to know or to, a, to EPA or someone like that and says, hey, we're working on this particular issue that we have with governance. How did you all approach that in your country? And can we have a discussion around that? So we do that pretty routinely where we'll say, this is how we set up this estuary program. This is how we set up this work that we're doing on blue carbon. And you know, if you want to do something similar, these are some things to consider and we'll have a dialogue about that. There may be other instances where we may want to do joint research projects. Um, so where a one country and another country may have similar interests in a particular topic, maybe related to climate change, maybe related to storms, something like that, or we're, we're trying to build especially recently, there's been a lot of work on disaster risk resilience. So really being prepared for disasters as they happen. Um, so working together with countries again, on how do we do early detection? How do we make sure that data is out there so that people can make good decisions in time? Um, so I think there's certainly work like that that happens as well. And for someone who's looking to get involved in more of this type of work within a country, I would encourage them to look, if they're thinking about public sector, look at it at multiple levels. So you could get involved in local government or the state or provincial government or national government. And most of those those have programs or ways that you can get involved early on and then tie, try that out and see how that works and then maybe expand your career from there. So there, there may be local opportunities as well that I'd encourage you to think about as well. Okay, great. Now, Vijay, the same question to you. And in terms of the technology that is being deployed, uh, are you engaging with the, with the uh, developing markets or, or emerging countries uh, that are grappling with some of these issues such as sanitation and, and water access? And how are you per, perhaps dealing with the local business communities uh, in developing countries and, and to address those things? Sure, I think uh, we are uh, working with several of those uh, countries as from my organization, because uh, it's a water issues are universal. There's no uh, boundaries to it. As we started this session, we established that. And also, uh, when you do the site kind of advanced reuse, such as uh, portable reuse, the lot of public acceptance issues that I see, it is not unique to one country because people are coming at the same project. The question people are asking is kind of universal in a way. So it makes it a little bit uh, more, this uh, technology or knowledge transfer much easier in a way because it's not like I don't have to deal. There is a different regulatory requirements from the government, but the people's expectations, people's uh, relation to water is kind of universal in a way. So that's, you know, it's a good trend. We are seeing, we are able to transfer some of the uh, learning curve from vice versa, because uh, there are some like Israel, if you take it, they have pioneered water efficiency much uh, further than us, and I think they get invited to WEF and other meetings all the time because as for the knowledge transfer. And uh, that's, I think, uh, another point I would like to make to this uh, person that's asking the question, water in, let's say, in the United States, in Canada, there is a independent associations that runs these, are dedicated to this issue. Some countries, it may be a civil engineer society that has a WASH network, sub-network within the civil engineering uh, meetings. So you need to also ex uh, check those uh, venues out before uh, kind of create your own. Uh, otherwise, I think you should create your own team to have like this like-minded people coming around and discussing their issues. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to switch um, to uh, another question now. And this has more to do with a, a skill set that could be a, a applicable in just about any sector or just about any profession. That's the value of mentors. But we're going to talk about it, of course, in, in terms of the water space. So uh, one of our viewers is asking, uh, what have been your experiences with mentors and what should young people look for in a good mentor? Uh, so I'd like to ask each one of you for your own experience and maybe tell us a little story about somebody who inspired you from your past, somebody who was really a good example and who kind of gave you some great insight. So Megan, let me start with you. I mean, what, what should young people look for uh, in a good mentor, particularly in your space? Uh, someone that listens, um, someone that is also passionate, um, which it's not hard to find at all in the water sector because most people are incredibly passionate, all of them that I've met. Um, 
but someone that's really willing to, I think, for me, speak frankly with me and give me feedback, whether it be, I like, I don't, I'm not looking for someone to sugarcoat it for me. I'm asking a question, how can I do this better? And really working with me and kind of giving me a different perspective. I think that's so important. So say early on in my career, I was doing marketing and business development, but I had a mentor that was actually an operator. Um, and he gave me a lot of great insights on working with people or how to handle various situations. And I think it's really important not only to be working with someone um, in your same kind of area, but also in a different area, because that gives you a completely different perspective, which is so, so important. Um, and you can never have too many mentors. I truly believe that. And I also think that it's kind of a give and take, like the mentor can actually teach or the mentee can actually teach the mentor something as well. Um, so really having that back and forth relationship is great as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a very valid point because you, these days, a lot of young people, again, this has to do with technology. Uh, a lot of the people who are coming up now and enter in, entering into these fields are digital natives. You know, they've grown up with social media. It's second nature to them to be able to communicate virtually, for example. So, uh, and there is sort of a generational shift there as well. So that's a very interesting point that. Um, you know, the mentors can also learn from the mentees. So, uh, and Rocky, the same question for you. I mean, again, for your space in the government, uh, it can be very complex and there are lots of different stakeholders that you're dealing with. What should somebody look for in a mentor as a guide uh, to help them navigate that? That's a great question. I think I've been really lucky that since I started in government, I had uh, really good managers and really good mentors um, pretty much all the way throughout my career. And I think that's part of what's kept me engaged in the work. I think it just makes such a difference when you have people that are supporting you, encouraging you and advocating for you. Um, so I think for someone who's coming into government, looking for someone who has a broad view of your organization, so can look across, not just in your specific organization, but maybe has experience in other parts of the office or other parts or other parts of government even, that can be really valuable. Um, I think someone who will give, and I think Megan alluded to this, um, honest feedback to you um, in, a, in a kind way, of course, but just someone who can sit down with you and sort of say, hey, have you thought about, you know, approaching this problem this way? Or, you know, I really think you've been doing this particular project for a while. It's really time for you to broaden your horizons and go try another project. Um, and, and someone who has enthusiasm and passion for public service, I think in our case, um, or in whatever sector you're in, um, it's good to have a mentor that um, is passionate about the work and can communicate that to you and can help you make connections to others within the government. Um, so I think I've been really lucky that some of my mentors, when I told them there was a topic or a particular project that I was on, they could say, hey, I know somebody who's working on something like that. Let me introduce you all and you can have a chat. And I can't tell you how many times that has made a difference for me professionally is just having someone who, who sends that quick email or makes that quick phone call. Absolutely. And I, I'd like to emphasize to all of our viewers that uh, again, just ask questions, you know, uh, don't worry about, well, are they going to think that maybe I'm being too pushy or something like that? Just ask nine times out of 10. If you ask somebody for their help, they're going to give it to you. That's been my experience as well. Uh, and um, I think something that is very important is what Megan said is finding a mentor who is going to be honest with you and who is not going mm -hmm. to just kind of tell you what you want to hear uh, because they don't want to deal with you. But, you know, find somebody who is going to be honest with you and take the time and say, you know, you shouldn't do this. You should do that, even though you may think it's the right thing. Uh, somebody who is going to really guide you. And those are very important people and good relationships. So, uh, VJ, the same question to you. Um, in terms of a mentor, what should somebody look for if they wanted to get into the business side or the consulting sure. side? I think uh, the, the qualities of the mentor and mentor relationship that Rocky and Megan mentioned, it's fully transferable to uh, this the, the world I live in. The one, one of my friends suggested this phrase and it stuck in my mind for more than 10 years. So I'll share that with the audience here is the mentors are like, if you are a company, they are like your board of directors. So if you uh, think about it, I think all this frankness and passion and vested interest of your growth, it's all makes sense in a way. So, and it doesn't have to be uh, in one time of your career. I have mentors, uh, I had mentors since I was in high school. So I think uh, that they will come, they will show up. 
some cases, uh, in our case. Uh, so we need to uh, work with them and nurture them. So. Absolutely. I, I think that's a great point, too, is that you never stop learning. You know, mentors are always important to have and you can always learn something new, especially when you're dealing with something like the water space and particularly climate change as well, because there's so many people and so many different impacts that are involved there. So uh, that is a great thought to close on. And we're going to stop there for today. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today uh, for being with us and providing their thoughts and insights. Uh, and I'd, I'd also like to ex uh, extend a special thank you uh, to the leaders of the North American Youth Parliament for Water for their insight and participation in the development of this program and also for submitting some of those stories. Uh, those were great to see. And don't forget that World Water Day is coming up on March 22nd. And this program is being recorded and will be available on this webpage in the next 48 hours. So if you'd like to go ahead and review some of these comments or maybe send it on to friends and colleagues, uh, please do so. We'll have that uh, the video recording up uh, within about two days. So my name is Lauren Hurst, and I'm with the U.S. State Department's Bureau of Global Public Affairs. And I'd like to thank all of our viewers for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the program. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.